South African anti-apartheid icon, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, described as the country's moral compass, died on Sunday, aged 90, sparking an outpouring of tributes for the outspoken Nobel Peace Prize winner. Details in this report. The raison d'etre for this commission is opening wounds, cleansing them so that they do not fester and saying we have dealt with our past as effectively as we could. We have not denied it. We have looked the beast in the eye. Archbishop Desmond Mpilo Tutu, born in Kirkstop, Transvaal, on 7th October 1931 in South Africa, was a strong voice against apartheid in South Africa. In the transition to democracy, Tutu was an influential figure promoting the concept of forgiveness and reconciliation. He was recognized as the moral conscience of South Africa as he frequently lent his voice to issues of justice and peace. After the passage of apartheid, Bantu Education Act in 1953, Tutu resigned from teaching in protest at the diminished opportunities for black South Africans. He continued to study, concentrating on theology in 1955, he married Nomalizo Lia Shenzane. They had four children together, and in 1961, he was ordained an Anglican priest. Tutu moved to England in 1962, where he studied at King's College, London, and gained a master's degree in theology. He also became a part-time curate in St. Albans and Golders Green. Five years after he returned to South Africa, and became increasingly involved in the anti-apartheid movement. He was influenced, among others, by fellow Anglican Bishop Trevor Hoddleston. Tutu's understanding of the Gospels and his Christian faith meant he felt compelled to take a stand and speak out against injustice. O oh, Holy Spirit, calm the turmoil within in 1976, there were increasing levels of protest by black South Africans against apartheid, especially in Soweto. In one of his speeches, Tutu said, Far too often people think of themselves as just individuals separated from one another, whereas we are connected and what we do affects the whole world. When you do well, it spreads out. It is for the whole of humanity according to him. In his position as a leading member of the clergy, Desmond Tutu used his influence to speak firmly and unequivocally against apartheid, often comparing it to fascist regimes. One of his favorite words in bringing people together was Ubuntu, meaning I am because we are. Well, joining us live on the news to talk about Archbishop Desmond Tutu, his life, times and struggles against apartheid is political analyst Gogo Aubrey Machike. Good evening, Gogo. Uh, good evening. Our condolences to you and your brothers and sisters in South Africa. Thank you very much. But when you talk about a man like the Archbishop, uh, so many things just comes up. Uh, but when you talk about impact, what, what would he and should he be remembered for? Well, to understand his impact, particularly during the liberation struggle against apartheid, we must bear in mind that many leaders of the liberation movement were either dead, in prison, or in exile. So in some ways, there was a leadership uh, virtue. But he comes to the fore at a time his own church, the Anglican church, is refusing to take a stance against apartheid. So when he does take a stance against apartheid, to some extent he contributes to the feeling of this vacuum of uh, leadership. Because, as I said, many a leader was either dead or in prison or in exile. But what he does, he also directs his moral courage towards his own church 
the Anglican Church, but also towards all oppressive regimes, particularly during the liberation struggle, the apartheid government. But what he does also is to direct his moral courage elsewhere in the world where oppression is happening. And that is why he speaks out against the oppression of the people of Tibet and the oppression of Palestinians. In fact, indeed, he was described and he's been described as a universal voice. How important do you think it is for his legacy to live on and for people to truly understand what he lived for and what he stood for? Well, I, I think as we reflect on his transition to the next phase of his eternal journey, we must reflect on the most important lessons he taught us. He taught us many. And some of those lessons were lessons in love. He taught us love for the other, irrespective of race, gender, culture, religion, country of origin, um, or sexual orientation, and so on. But I think of those lessons, uh, the most important is the lesson that love and freedom are indivisible and therefore cannot be reserved only for those who are like us. And to the extent that they can be, they must be reserved especially for those who are not us. And it is for this reason that he spoke against oppression wherever it read its ugly head. And but because his chief message was that of love, he spoke both to the oppressor and the oppressed. He spoke to the heart of both the oppressor and the oppressed in the belief that all men and women, irrespective of how evil they are, are capable of change. And in that, if he was a very optimistic man, believing that because of that capacity, for men and women to change for the better, they can therefore change the world for the better. Yeah, he was known for his brutal truth. He, he spoke truth to power, um, especially against apartheid and um, other issues in South Africa. Has leadership changed for the better on the continent, would you say? Well, I'm afraid that... Um, leadership on the continent is characterized in the main by how so-called African leaders are betraying the aspirations and wishes of so-called ordinary South Africans and Africans. Now, what, what we find, if you start with Af as Africa before, you go to the continent as a whole. You, you must remember that the struggle against apartheid animated the imagination of peoples all over the world. Mm -hmm. And when South Africa attained freedom in 1994, that gave hope to all who were downtrodden, to all who remained wretched of the earth, all over the, uh, all, all over the world, that there was hope for them too. But as we speak, in South Africa, the principles and values which impelled the people of South Africa to act against the apartheid regime, supported by many around the world, around the world, are being betrayed. But we see that this betrayal is not limited to South Africa. Because, as I said, the aspirations of the ordinary African are being betrayed by too many African leaders on our continent. I would like you to buttress a little bit more when you talk about this betrayal by the African leaders. Can you give us a few points on how they are perpetrating this betrayal? Well, if you look, for instance, at the African Union, which in the main is a club of men, you must remember that um, one of the 
greater struggles Africa must still engage with is coloniality. This coloniality suggests that those who are not white are epistemologically and ontologically inferior. In other words, those who are not white, in this case, Africans are epistemologically inferior, meaning they lack the capacity to create knowledge and gain knowledge, and are also ontologically inferior, meaning that they are not human, if they are not as human as those who are white. That is the logic which drove colonialism, the logic of coloniality, a logic that still persists today in the relationship between Africa and Europe and other parts of the world. And what we see is that too many African leaders have become, have become allies of coloniality, therefore perpetuating the sins and ravages of colonialism, even in what is supposed to be our post-colonial setting. Okay, well, we'll just leave it there because of time. I would have loved to explore more on that. But let's go back to the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, moral compass is one of the major takeouts when describing him. Um, would you agree that he was one of the world's moral compasses? Well, if you look at the relationship he strikes with the Dalai Lama, uh, this relationship blossoms. Precisely because this man of small physical stature, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, is a colossus, is a giant when it comes to moral courage. This is a legacy he leaves not for only for us, South Africans, but this is a legacy that is an inspiration for peoples all over the world particularly, as I said, those who remain downtrodden and who remain the wretched of the earth. All right, you know, um, finally, growing up, he was one of those figures we saw in the news, read about in the papers, him, you know, Nelson Mandela. Uh, do you think there's anyone who could actually fit into his shoes in Africa? Well... <laughs> I had this belief that one's shoes were designed for that person only. Our challenge is, is to be cobblers who make other shoes that can be filled by other great men and women. And therefore, our salvation must not be limited to a small group of men and women. Our challenge is to make sure that we produce in our societies all over the world other men, other women who can wear their own shoes of greatness. But remember that greatness does not only lie in the deeds and words of great men and women, but greatness resides also in the spirit of so-called ordinary people and their will to change their lot and make their lives better. Well, thank you so much, Gogo Aubrey Motsiki, for your time. And um, once again, um, our condolences to you and your people in South Africa. Thank you very much. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.